The Prepper Podcast, Episode 10. Whether or not their president is the American people would never vote for socialism. He said, under the name of liberalism, the American people will adapt every fragment of the socialist program. survival podcast based on military wilderness and modern day survival and may be found at the preppopodcast.com i am ken jensen and this is the podcast about everything survival this is a special episode guys i didn't know if i would make it to this uh, so it looks like i'm in hit for the long haul this is episode 10 and i'm going to answer the question of what a backup generator is and explain to you quickly how to choose one for your standby power generation this episode may be found at theprepperpodcast.com slash 010 for the show notes. You can see all the notes that I use in order to put this podcast on, and I will link to things that um, I deem beneficial. And some of those links, I need to tell you right now, some of those links are going to be affiliate links. Affiliate links Give me a small commission whenever you buy something using those links. It does not cost you anything extra when you use an affiliate link. Sometimes it's actually cheaper. So if you want to help me out because I try to help you out, then go ahead and use those affiliate links when you are buying something. I also want to remind you guys to go ahead and uh, look me up on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. Um, Remember, I've told you on a couple podcasts now, I am on iTunes. You can go to thepreferpodcast.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to where I am located on iTunes. You can also go to thepreferpodcast.com slash Stitcher and it will take you to my listing on Stitcher Radio. I would appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and you would give me a... um, a five-star review if you feel that I am worth it, but give me a review and go ahead and give me a comment. I do respond to the comments, so uh, go ahead, do that, and give me a con- uh, comment on my um, on my show notes as well if you feel led to. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about is when choosing a generator. Well, I guess I should tell you what a generator is since I said that's what I was going to cover. Ah, Okay. So a generator is a means of emergency power. It is an emergency backup source uh, so that you can continue to live your lives as you feel that you need to live your lives with electricity when the power goes out. That's all it is. And um, you've heard of people saying things like genset. What is a genset? Well, a genset is... A generator. So, we're going to talk about generators. We're going to talk about the different types of generators. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that you need to consider when buying one. First thing we're going to talk about is the first thing that you you should consider when buying a generator for your home. What are the loads in your house that you want or need to run? You're going to want to size your generator for those loads. On a generator, you're going to see load ratings. You're going to see something like 2,000 slash 3,000 watt. That's going to mean that it's 2,000 continuous watts and 3,000 peak watts. Okay, so what the heck does that mean? Well, 2,000 continuous watts means that you can pull 2,000 watts all the time. 3,000 peak watts means that this generator can take a small starting current so to speak, like when you're starting up like a pump or a blender or something like that that takes a lot of power to start it um, because things draw more power whenever you're starting them than they do to run um, this generator is rated to handle a 3000 watt peak okay so what the heck 
how, how do we know what we can pull, what watts or what, and all this? Well, I'm going to go ahead and go over that too. Think about the things that you want to run normally. A cell phone battery charger. This takes 10 watts. A Christmas, some Christmas lights. It takes 20 watts. If you do the LED Christmas lights, it's going to take even less. Laptop computer, 75 watts. Um, iPod, Blackberry cell phones, um, something like that, 80 watts. Uh, 13 inch TV, 100 watts. Outdoor bug light, 100 watts. Uh, radio or CD player, 100 watts. A 20 inch box fan, 200 watts. Video games, 200 watts. Crockpot, 250. Desktop computer, 300. And I don't really fully agree with that. I think a lot of desktop computers will pull 800 or so. Um, it really depends on what you have. But a laptop computer will only pull about 200. Um, the TV DVD combo, 300 refrigerator. Uh, it's going to be 350 uh, for a dorm size refrigerator. Um, well, this isn't fully accurate, but a dorm refrigerator is going to pull a little bit less um, because of the size of the um, compressor and stuff in it. But it doesn't pull significantly less than a full size refrigerator. Um, it actually will draw the same amount of power overall you have to consider overall as well is going to draw the same power overall because it's going to kick on more often because it has less efficient um, insulation on it so a dorm size refrigerator is going to pull 350 but it's got a starting current of 500 that's where your surge comes in a uh, food processor or a blender 350 with a surge of 500 Power tools, electric drill, 440 with a surge of 600. Uh, 27 inch color TV, 500. Uh, I don't know if I have on here the, uh, the uh, flat screen TVs, but the flat screen TVs obviously pull a lot less than the old CRT TVs. Uh, frying pan, um, like an electric frying pan or skillet, 600. A uh, refrigerator, 600, with a surge of 2,200. These are all in watts, guys. Microwave oven, 750 to 800. Uh, single element hot plate, 750. All right, so you get my point. All right, you get my point. And uh, just in general, let's consider, uh, let's say, like a electric fan, chainsaw, hand drill, blender, your coffee pot, all right, um, a microwave, a desktop, these are things that pull a lot of juice, all right, so let's keep those to a minimum. Why don't we just go to iPad or small LED TVs, uh, things like that for entertainment, um, so yeah, you know what? Let's start talking about uh, what we can do to conserve a little bit of power. All right, so if you think about all of the uh, loads that I spouted off, uh, most typical homes can use a 5,000-watt generator and run most of the loads. Not all the time, but most of the time. So it'll run most loads most of the time. If you do it correctly, you can run almost everything on 2,500 watts. And that means that you know how to rotate your loads. That means doing thing, or uh, you know how to rotate your loads and you know how to reduce your loads. What this means is instead of using incandescent overhead lights, you're going to use uh, small wattage LED lights in lamps, and you're going to plug those into your generator. You're going to use things like the um, uh, the th 1,000 gain, um, 1,000 to 1 hand crank blender, a French press instead of a coffee pot, because guess what, guys? The coffee pot, that sucker pulls like 10 amps. That thing pulls like 1,000 watts. 1,000 watts just to keep your coffee hot because that coil underneath is really um, is a really high power coil and it's very inefficient. So instead of using the standard coffee pot, I actually do have a Keurig. We just bought one not too long ago. Uh, I am not going to tell people to buy a Keurig because it still does take quite a bit of power and it does have some uh, phantom power draw. But I do believe in using a French press. 
a French press is essentially this. You're going to throw some hot water in it. You're going to put some coffee in there with the hot water, and you're going to have a little plunger with a screen on the bottom of it. You're going to throw the screen into the French press, which is just a big cup, essentially, and you're going to push the screen in and out of the cup multiple times. You're basically just pressing the coffee, and then you can you know, pour out made coffee into your coffee mug. And believe it or not, I have had regular coffee pots. I have a Keurig. And I would take a cup of French press coffee any day over those. And it takes almost no power. It just takes you to get off of your couch and to move a stem up and down until you get the desired darkness. All right, so instead of heating a home, instead of heating a room, you can heat individual people. We are big believers in electric blankets just because it is so easy to use and it is easy to heat everybody in the home with a few electric blankets. As a matter of fact, we have it on our list to go buy a few more because it's winter time and it's just good to have electric blankets for everybody. We may not use them, but it's nice to know that we have them. For cooking, let's not, uh, if you've got an electric stove and you're on a generator right now, you probably should not be cooking on your electric range. You should be cooking with propane or gas or an alcohol stove. Um, you should be using the um, uh, gas burners on the side of your grill or a standalone gas burner. You should uh, you should be using uh, your propane grill or something like that. So you should be using something other than electricity. Right now, you're on a generator. Gasoline is being converted, or diesel, or natural gas. We'll talk about that later. But this stuff is being converted into electricity, and then you're going to use the electricity to convert it back over to heat. When each process of uh, energy conversion is inefficient and it's going to have losses. So each time you have to convert from one medium to another, you're going to have natural losses. So the more times you have to do it, you're going to have more losses. So why not go straight from, if let's say you got natural gas, why not go straight from natural gas to heat instead of from natural gas to electricity, from electricity inefficiently to heat? Or why would you go from gasoline to electricity and then from electricity over to heat? That, that It doesn't make any sense to do it this way, so we should not do it this way. All right, You can um, turn a decent refrigerator on, and we're not talking about the dorm refrigerators. Like I said, remember I said dorm refrigerators, they have sucky um, insulation on them. So... Yeah, they may draw a little bit less power, but they're on all the freaking time because they, and you would think, because it's a smaller amount of space, that this uh, refrigerator is going to keep better. But it's not. It's a smaller amount of space, but it has very little insulation. So, if you have a decent refrigerator, you can probably plug it in for a couple hours and then shut it off most of the rest of the day. And it'll keep everything cold as long as it's kept closed. It's almost the same with freezers. You may have to leave them on a little longer, and you may have to occasionally open it up to check and make sure everything's staying frozen. Because if it's not staying frozen, you need to keep it plugged in longer. These are just a few uh, little suggestions that I had. Um, just kind of give, just kind of kind of get your gears turning a little bit up there, and so that you understand, you don't have to run everything that is normal to run on a generator, and. Um, so now that that's uh, said, let's go ahead and uh, think about the generators and buying the generators. Uh, the, pri the typical price of a generator is going to cost you about 7 to $10 per watt. 
All right, so if you think about it, a 100-watt generator could cost you 700 to to $1,000. And we're talking about name-brand generators. We're not talking about uh, crummy generators. And uh, to be honest with you, the lower the ro- lower price generators are actually going to be cheaper per watt than the higher. Um, the upper wattage generators, um, the lower wattage generators will be cheaper per watt. But there's a certain point, you know, no one wants to buy a 100 watt generator. You're going to want, you know, a 1,000 watt generator to a 2,000 watt generator. You know, you're, you're not going to want to get stuck with a 100 watt generator. Not I mean, I don't even know if they make those, but you get what I'm saying. So, 7 to $10 per watt, um, and you're going to pay somewhere in that area to buy a generator. So, if you go and you see a generator that's going to be about 20 to $30 a watt, you know you're getting ripped off and you need to go somewhere else, because don't do business with someone who's going to cheat you. There are different types of generators. This is what I was kind of referring to a little bit earlier. You have uh, PTO mounted generators. You have permanent generators. You have portable generators. There's other generators. You have large gen sets. You have um, um, other, you know, commercial size generators. You have um, uh, dual bearing generators, things like that. Um, things that mount in trucks. You have uh, arc welders that are built into generators, things like that. But we're trying to talk about on the cheap. So the cheapest types of generators are going to be permanent PTO and portable models. Portable model generators are actually going to be some of the cheapest generators when compared to permanent and PTO mounted generators. PTO mounted generators are kind of cool if you uh, have a tractor and that's what you want to use, but I really don't see the benefit in using a PTO generator than over a portable or a permanent generator. I do see an advantage of a portable generator over both the uh, permanent and PTO mounted generators, mostly because they are cheapest and they can provide the same power. Now, the disadvantage of a portable generator is it's a little bit more difficult to uh, tie it into your home if you're wanting to do something inside the infrastructure of your home. It's going to be a little bit harder to do, but um, it's still a lot cheaper, and for your first generator, I would recommend portable generators. You do have natural gas portable generators and this is uh kind of what i was talking about earlier uh natural gas generators are pretty cool because you can just tie them into your natural gas typically when the power goes out you're not going to lose natural gas as a matter of fact if you lost all power today and every person on the face of this earth just disappeared the natural gas system would run for six months minimum with no intervention assuming something catastrophic didn't just happen to the natural gas system but the natural gas system is designed to run on its own it uses the natural gas that it's moving in order to run things so natural gas system very reliable system there are you know for for the prepper type people there are inherent problems with being tied to a natural gas system (laughs) but for the first generator it it might be a really good thing to have a natural gas generator you know if if you're really um prepping for end of the world scenarios then you should probably be looking into something that will allow you to do wood gas and things like that but guess what natural gas generators can use wood gas think about it all right, so a natural gas generator. There's a big advantage with these. Um, it's a dollar fifty to two dollars cheaper per gallon than using a gasoline generator. Think about that. How much cheaper that is. The fact that you don't have to go to the store and wait in a three mile long line to get gasoline because you're still tied to a system when you're going off of gasoline. You don't have to stand in line and wait to pick up gasoline for your generator you're at home you're tied into your natural gas lines and you get the same power output for a dollar fifty to two dollars cheaper per gallon uh cha-ching people pay attention here get a natural gas generator 
don't waste your time with a gasoline generator if you can afford to get the natural gas generator instead. Generac and Champion, uh, Briggs and Stratton, these are all decent brand names. So, I mean, if you just go with a decent name and generators, um, you, you don't have to go with um, the leading in industrial technology and stuff like that in order to get a good generator nowadays. Uh, they all make pretty good generators. Um, and as a matter of fact, Harbor Freight's got one, I think... <sighs> I don't remember what the name brand of it is, but Harbor Freight has one. It's pretty darn cheap um, as far as the watt, the watt per uh, dollar or whatever. Um, it's up to you if you want to rely on something like that, but I'm pretty sure that it had a Briggs & Stratton motor, so it wasn't a horrible generator. It was actually a halfway decent one. Um, so there you go. You can um, you should probably consider getting a basic DC to AC inverter first. And the reason why I say consider getting the inverter first is because you can get yourself an 800 watt inverter for probably 80 to 120 dollars. <throat> so think about that: 800 watts, 100 dollars. So you're getting eight watts per dollar instead of seven to ten. Okay, so. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. Uh, I had something caught in my throat. I had a little bit of coffee earlier, and I guess the warm is kind of breaking up some stuff in my throat. So I apologize for uh, <laughs> for all that. But um, it's a real cheap way of getting power. And you can take the inverter, you can connect it up to your car battery, and you can crank your car uh, up, turn it on, let it run, and now you've made an 800 watt generator. You are not going to run your house on this, but you will be able to run some select loads. All right, so we've considered the inverter. Um, connecting your generator. Uh, you should consider uh, gen cords uh, or power transfer systems. So uh, I would say for your first purchase, don't worry about a power transfer system. All that is is a, a bus tie. It's a bus transfer switch. You're going to plug your generator into it, and you're going to flip some switches, and you're going to make it go through the wiring in your home. So that's what a power transfer system is. Uh, they have automatic transfer systems. They have manual transfer systems. And obviously the automatic is going to cost you more than the manual. Or you could just go ahead and connect with a gen cord. And on one side of the gen cord is going to be this weird four-prong power cord thing. And it's going to sit there and it, it's called a twist lock. But anyways, let's keep it, uh, let's keep it basic. Uh, so you're going to have the, this funky connection and you're going to plug it in to your inverter. Let's be certain that if your if your generator it has a 250 outlet you're not plugging a 125 twist lock on it okay it's important that you understand this the twist locks are not supposed to be designed for them to fit but what i am telling you is on occasion you will get a faulty cable it is wired wrong and you will crash and burn your place down so just check the plug on the end of your gen cord if you bought it if you built it don't be a dummy put the right one on it your gen cord you're going to plug it in twist lock it in place on the other end you are going to have receptacles and those receptacles i would plug and uh, i would plug a um i have these little three-way uh, connections that you can get. Um, I'll make a note real quick for myself to go ahead and put a link to that as well. Alright, so it's a three-way T-shaped 
grounded outlet adapter is what it's called, and I will send a link to it. I just made a reminder to myself on my show notes to give you guys the uh, three-way splitter link. It will be an affiliate link, so remember, I will get a very small commission from Amazon whenever you click on this link. Another thing to remember when buying a generator is... Or, or actually when setting up a generator, is you have a gen cord set, right? We've already talked about this. And you're going to have a three-prong outlet on the other side, the typical three-prong outlet with a ground on it. Well, guess what? That ground does you absolutely no good if you don't ground your generator. I have seen lots of forums where everybody is saying not to ground your generator. Oh, I've seen everybody... And they, they don't ground their generator, um, and everything works fine. Yeah, that's fine. Everything's going to work fine because you didn't pinch your cable and you didn't uh, get something grounded inside um, the device that you're using. Here's the deal. What a ground is used for is not for making the device work. What a ground is used for is not for protecting a person. It will protect a person to some degree, but it is not designed for that. What it is designed for is it is designed to allow a return path through the ground, back up the ground rod, back to the generator to trip the breaker. (laughs) That is what it's allowing. Okay, so if you don't have a ground available, or or if you don't ground your generator, I'm sorry, if you don't ground your generator, then you are putting yourself at risk because guess what? There's a good chance that it's just going to see electricity going through you as, mm, I don't know, just running a motor or a resistor in the circuit. But if you have something that's grounded and you have a ground rod on your generator, there's a good chance that the breaker is going to be tripped on your generator and it's going to protect you because that's the way it's designed. It's not designed to protect you. It's designed to protect the generator. But I'm going to tell you that it is going to protect you if it works properly to some degree. You can still get electrocuted and stuff, but it it makes it a lot better. Um, What I also recommend is putting uh, GFCIs. Not all of your receptacles being GFCIs off of this generator. Okay, GFCIs are the ones that you see in your bathroom. They are required by code to be in a bathroom or any place where there's going to be a lot of water. These uh, GFCIs have the little push buttons on them in the middle and where you can trip them and reset them and stuff. And they're a nuisance and they're a pain. And everybody's like, oh, this stupid receptacle, I got to always go in there and I got to push it and reset it. But guess what? Here's the deal. This is this is the way it works. You have a you have a hot and a return path of current. And what it does is it looks and it sees does the return path, the amount of electricity flowing on the return path does that match the amount of power going out on the hot path? Okay, so does the return equal what's going out? If the return does not equal what's going out, it thinks it must be going somewhere else. It must be leaking. Where is it leaking? Possibly through you. So the GFCI is instantly going to trip. That is why I prefer to have as many GFCIs as possible on the circuit. Now here's the deal. I don't want all GFCIs because certain things trip GFCIs all the time because they have a lot of leakage current. Old refrigerators being one of those. So, you want a bunch of GFCIs, but you also want another receptacle that is not GFCI so that you, if you're having a lot of trips and stuff with the GFCI because the generator is doing something wonky, or because uh, whatever you're plugging into the receptacle keeps tripping it out, then uh, you may want to consider not using that device. However, some of the older devices are going to trip GFCIs, so you're going to go ahead and put those on normal receptacles. It's not that big a deal um, 
to try it on the normal receptacle because if there's something wrong with the device, as long as you're not touching a metal device that's grounded, um, then you may just plug it in and see if it trips the breaker. I mean, as an electrician, I do that quite often. I do not condone that, though. I am not giving you a suggestion to do that because I have legal reasons for not telling you to do that. That is not how electricians are uh, supposed to troubleshoot. So that is not going to be how someone who is not an electrician is supposed to troubleshoot because they have less knowledge about it than the electrician. So uh, I think we just pretty much went over everything that is on here. Yes, yes, we have covered pretty much everything on my notes. Um, so I would like for each and every one of you to go ahead and research the personal power requirements that you have for your generator. And I would like for you to uh, think about ways in which you can reduce your power consumption instead of using uh, incandescent bulbs or compact fluorescent bulbs. Uh, just have a few um, LED bulbs and um, use those instead on your generator. Um, the, the thing about it is, is we want to um, reduce our consumption as much as possible because we can get the same effect with minimal consumption. When we have minimal consumption, we can buy a smaller generator. When we buy a smaller generator, it costs us less cha-ching, okay? It's going to cost us less green, and that's a good thing. We don't want to be cheap, but we do want to be cost effective. So research your personal power requirements and think about ways in which you can use less or no electricity for the function that you are trying to achieve. That is your call to action. The next thing I want you to do is please go to iTunes, leave me a comment, and leave me that review. Um, five star if, if you think I'm worthy. Four star if that's all I'm worth. Three star if um, if that if you think that's all I'm worth. I hope I'm not three star uh, because I do try hard to give you guys information. And uh, if you are going to give me a one or a two star, then you know what? Stay off the computer. Just leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But please uh, go over there. Give me a review. Give me a comment on iTunes. Once again, that is theprepperpodcast.com slash iTunes. Pretty easy to get there. That's all you have to do. And uh, you know what? Go on over to my show notes. Follow those links. Um, and uh, you don't necessarily have to buy anything, but if you follow those links, you'll see what I'm talking about. And um, leave me some comments on my show notes, too. Comments on the show notes, uh, you know, make make everything a little bit better. I, I see every comment that comes through, so I'll be able to respond to anything. Uh, once again, you can email me if you have any questions. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here's another thing. Um, I haven't told you guys. I do have a new number. I have a listener feedback line. It's pretty freaking awesome. This is the number. It is... Uh, hold on one second. The listener feedback line number is 978 knows it. As in, I know it all. No, I actually don't know very much, but uh, I am constantly learning. I like to say that I am a student of survival. I am not a survival expert. I will never be a survival expert. I am a student of survival. But... That is the number that I could get that is easy to remember. So it's 978 knows it. And for those of you that don't have letters on your touchpads, it is 978 566 9748. Once again, if you go to theprepperpodcast.com, you will see my number on the left hand side of the webpage. You can call that number and you can leave me customer feedback and I will play it on the show. If you want to remain anonymous, you must tell me that you want to remain anonymous and I will rem keep you anonymous. If you um, have a microphone or something like that on your computer, or internal microphone on a laptop, if you have a chat mic or something like that, it will give me better quality 
I have a button on my website that you can press to record a message to me and it will do the exact same thing as the listener feedback line. I will get that and I will be able to play it on the show. Once again, if you want to remain anonymous, then tell me that you want to remain anonymous and I promise you I will try to do so. Um, so if you're going to leave a question on my feedback line, I want you to give me your name, your state, then give me your one to two sentence question. After you have given me your one to two sentence question, then you can go ahead and give me a, a detailed explanation of what you want me to know. But you must give me the question first. It will just make things flow much easier. Sometimes I may not have to read or I may not have to listen to your entire thing to give you the answer that you're looking for. But if I don't know what the question is, I can't um, I can't decide that and I will have to read or listen to the whole thing. And right now, guys, I'm I'm pretty busy. So if you don't follow this there's a chance that I might have to weed you out if other people are following my rules and I don't have time to get to yours. Uh, so to keep it that way, go ahead, make it a one to two sentence question, then give me your explanation, okay? I want to get to every call and I want to answer every question. Go ahead, give me a call. That's 978 knows it. Knows it. Or 978-566-9748. Or you can go to my website and you can press the button to record your message. I thank you guys very much for listening to the PrepperPodcast.com episode 10. I can't believe that I made it to episode 10. Um, I didn't know. You know, they say that if a podcast uh, doesn't, or if a podcast makes it to episode 10, the chances of the podcast uh, succeeding uh, and moving on goes up substantially. So the fact that I've made it to episode 10 is a bigger deal to me than it is to you, but that tells me that I'm in it for the long haul. Okay? So remember, just go there and uh, you know what? I wish you guys a really great week. Um, I hope that you enjoyed your Thanksgiving with your family and I want you to just think about this time of the year as a big reset button for you um, just this entire time of the year. Um, when it gets closer to Christmas, these podcasts may become sporadic. I may not do one. I may do a Christmas special. I don't know because it's more important for me during the, in the Thanksgiving and Christmas time to be with my family and to do uh, the things that I feel are important beyond the podcast but uh, I feel that the podcast is a very important thing for me to focus on as well. So I may do a special. Uh, I'm sorry for rambling on, guys. But you guys have a really great week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.